We are uh, very pleased to have on our campus today uh, Professor Aaron Mayer uh, of Bar Ilan University and also his wife who is visiting uh, with him today, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dina Mayer, who is also a, a senior lecturer at the uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. It's kind of a high power group to have here. You've got these uh, coming at you at the left and the right, uh, these great academics who, who are married. They happen to be right now um, on a, um, a visiting professorship at the University of uh, San Diego uh, and uh, were able to come up uh, this weekend uh, specifically with the purpose of speaking here. I have known Professor Mayer for, well, probably since 1996 uh, when he first began the uh, excavations at Gath. Uh, I didn't start working with him closely at Gath for another five years until 2001. But in that time, he has become a great friend, and I can testify to the uh, type of an individual he is, both as a scholar and as a gentleman. Aaron Mayer uh, was uh, born in the United States, uh, grew up uh, in his very earliest years, mostly in the New York area. His parents uh, immigrated to Israel in uh, 1969, wasn't it, Aaron? And uh, so uh, he naturally became a citizen there and grew up and went through schooling there. Um, uh, served uh, with distinction in the Israeli Defense Forces and uh, pursued his uh, academic work at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in the archaeology of Israel and received his PhD there. He has uh, excavated at many sites in Israel. We just had a very nice session with some of the Near Eastern Studies students here in which uh, uh, Aaron in an informal way, went through all the places he's excavated, and uh, I, I would have run out of fingers and toes to count them all. But he is uh, best known for his work since 1996 as the director of the Tel Es Safi Gat, or Gath as we say it, archaeological project, which was one of the uh, largest major archaeological projects in the Middle East. Uh, this is a project affiliated with Bar Ilan University, where he is a professor of archaeology in the Martin Sue's Department of uh, Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology. And uh, Professor Mayer will have a lot more to tell you about Gath of the Philistines, so we won't go on with that, uh, and I won't belabor this anymore. I give you Professor Aaron Mayer. Well, uh, it's still good morning. We'll say good morning still. So good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's my third visit to um, BYU, and each time it's more fun than the, uh, than the uh, time before. And I have to tell you a secret that um, after uh, we finished the lecture, um, uh, my wife and Jeff and, and Kim and his wife, are, we're going uh, to Moab. Now, since it was just Shavuot, the Feast of Shavuot was the Feast of uh, a Pentecost, right? Um, and in Jewish tradition, um, uh, you read the Book of Ruth on, on Shavuot because, among other things, um, it, the, it's the traditional date of the death of David. And, of course, at the end of the Book of Ruth, it gives David's uh, genealogy. So uh, we decided that we're going to go to Moab and walk around and asking people, are you Root? Are you Root? <laughs> so, so, so if we do find Root, you'll, you'll find out. Um, anyway, but let's go on to uh, more serious things. Um, I, I would like in this um, rather brief um, 40, 45 minutes to give an introduction to some of the interesting finds we found at the site. And um, I can talk about this excavation for hours, and basically you have to just pull me off stage, but I'll try to keep it as uh, within the framework of our discussion, uh, that the time that's been allotted for this. So if we start coming in from outer space, um, we end up at uh, this large site, which is situated in uh, central Israel. Um, and you can see here, the, uh, marked off the five major sites of the Philistines, the, the Philistine Pentapolis, the three along the coast, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Gaza, and the two inland, Ekron and Tel Asafi. And here you can see what we call in biblical geography the, um, the, the, the area of Philistia, where the Philistines lived, or in modern geography, the southern coastal plain. And then you can see Tel Asafi is located on the border between the coastal plain and the area to the east, and this is the area that we call the foothills or the Shvela. And this is a transition zone between those people who live in the coast 
and those people who live in the central hills over here, that during the biblical period, the Israelites were here, the Philistines were here, and this transition zone in the middle was where these people met. And if you follow many of the biblical stories of the interactions between the Philistines and the Israelites, a lot of them occur during that area. The story of David and Goliath, the story of Samson, etc. So this site that we're working at is in fact the easternmost of the Philistine sites, the one facing the area of the Israelites, and we'll see there's ongoing interaction um, uh, due to this. Now, a, a view of the site, could you see this? This is a little... Yeah, maybe, um, I think they, right, we could use some more. I don't need a, a light up here, so uh, you can shut off everything. No. Au contraire. There you go. Okay, how's that? Okay. So here's a view looking from the east towards the west, towards the Mediterranean coast. There's Tel Asafi in the, in the uh, background. And that's Gaza. That's the northern coast of Sinai going towards Egypt. That's Ashkelon, the two um, <coughs> Philistine sites I mentioned before. And this is the Elah Valley, which leads out from the central hills, from the area of the Israelites, out towards the coast. And this is the location according to the biblical text of the, of the famous battle between David and Goliath. So you can see here that Tel Asafi, Gath, is located the first stop. If the Philistines are going eastwards, this is where they would be coming out from. And in fact, in the biblical text, when it tells us what happened after David killed Goliath, the Philistines ran away towards the west to Gath and to Ekron, which was just to the north of us. Um, moving on. Um, an interesting issue, though, is the identity of the site. For some reason, it's not moved there. The site is called Tel Asafi. Tel Asafi in Arabic means something like the pure mound. And um, it doesn't retain an ancient name. And since everybody wants to f wanted for many, many years to find the location of ancient Gat, they were looking around in southern Israel for a site which was called something similar to Gat, just like Ashkelon, we know where it is because the Arabic name retains the ancient Semitic name, or Ashdod, or Ekron, etc., or Jerusalem, um, and, and many other sites. Here, there was no ancient site uh, that had a name similar to it. So for many years, there was a big discussion on where the site could be located. And the site sort of moved around all over in various places. And um, for various reasons, already in the 1970s, it was decided by most scholars that the most logical uh, location really should be at Gat, and all the other suggestions that had been raised in the past really didn't work. And so when we started our excavation in 1996, the question was still up in the air, but we had, I, I already was quite convinced that we're dealing with Gat, and, and as I always say, even though we haven't yet found the sign, welcome to God, um, home of Goliath, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, you know the, the famous basketball center. Um, uh, actually, I don't know, if he, he might be a, uh, um, a football guard maybe, not a basketball center. Um, so uh, we, we have found all the finds that we would expect to have if it was got, and all the finds we expect not to have if it was gone, and I think the case is, uh, to a large extent, uh, closed. There. Now, um, the site of God is, uh, as um, uh, Jeff was uh, telling us, a very large site. In fact, it's one of the largest sites in the, or largest pre-classical sites, the pre-Greek sites, Greek period sites in the uh, Near East. And these are views of the site from various uh, um, um, various directions, and you can see here how the, it's comprised of a very large, imposing tell, multi-period mound, which stands out from afar. But in addition, and this is something we learned from our work, is that there's many areas settled around the tell itself. And these, if I move back here, uh, no, now move forward, um, look at that white cliff there. That is what gave the site its Arabic name. 
because if it had white cliffs, the pure mound is a reference to those uh, cliffs. Now, the site was more or less settled continuously from late prehistoric times till modern times. And in fact, there was a, uh, a Palestinian village that existed on the site till 1948, till the Israeli War of Independence. And this is a picture taken in the 1920s. You can see the area of the modern village. So up until quite recently, major parts of the site were actually covered over by a, an existing village. And that's why in 1899, there you go, in 1899, uh, when uh, the British explorers Bliss and McAllister excavated the site, uh, they, very fortunately for us, only excavated for two weeks. And the reason being is that the site was covered over by the then, not abandoned village, but um, existing village, several graveyards, and when they came, there was a lot of malaria, so they didn't work there in the beginning. And then when they did start working there, they didn't get, get, they didn't get along with the villagers. So after two weeks of working on the site, they left. Now, you say, well, that's unfortunate. They didn't find things. Actually, it's very fortunate because the Bliss and McAllister excavated using horrible techniques, even for their time. And their publications are, you know, it's, it's, it's something to have in your library to have an old book, but it's really not worth much more than that. Um, and, and due to the fact that they worked there for two weeks, they in fact um, saved for posterity a lot of remains that we later on uh, came to be able to use. Now, when we came to the site in 1996, it was clear that the site was very uh, heavily covered by later remains, and in fact, between 1899 and 1996, when we started our project, the site was known to be important, but nobody worked on it. And the reason being is that everybody was convinced that the remains that you see here basically cover over the entire site. And for archaeologists interested in earlier periods, Bronze and Iron Age, the biblical periods, um, they would say, why would, should we go to this site where we have to dig through uh, medieval and modern remains? Let's go to sites where we can get to the early remains. And this was several of my teachers and their generation had, uh, had this uh, conclusion. And so we started by conducting a survey on the site and it turned out that large parts of the site were in fact not covered by the medieval and modern remains and gave us chance to excavate and find remains from the early periods. And in fact, since the beginning of our project, we've been basically excavating in the cracks or empty areas where the modern and medieval remains are not uh, seen on surface, and we've been very successful in this. And if you look here at a aerial uh, view of the site, you can see here the, the upper mound, a crescent-shaped upper mound, and this is a photograph taken in the 1940s, so you can see here the village still in existence, the various remains uh, the various areas of excavation, the remains of the Crusader castle, which we'll speak about later on the top of the tail, and what's marked off here and with the yellow arrows is a siege system, which I'll get back to in a moment. And here you can see the same thing in the plan. And if I can, how am I gonna do this? Uh, I have to, now that I don't have my computer, how do I control this thing? Let's see, does it work? Oh, this is, this is a problem, okay. Well, since I don't have my computer on combined, let's see if there's any way of getting this. What? Hmm? Oh, how'd that happen? Well, okay, it's not working. Um, th there would be a cool animated fly around of the site, but we'll skip that. Okay, um, now, uh, this gives you a representation of the uh, the various layers at the site. Now, I, you can barely see it, and I don't expect you to remember it, but what this gives you a nice feeling is from the early Bronze Age, uh, the third and fourth millennium BCE, up until the modern period, you can see a very, very dense um, sequence of sites one after the other. And this is very typical of, of ancient tell sites, of the multi-period sites. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna quickly go through, not all the periods, we're just gonna go through the finds from the Late Bronze Age, the Canaanite city, 
various stages of the Iron Age, if the thing will move, there from the very, and which is when the Philistines appear, and the various stages of the Philistines' uh, activity on the site, and then when the Philistines, uh, are, the site is destroyed, and then the Judites, the Israelites take over, and then finally, the Crusader period, and briefly about the modern period. So let's go on. So let's start with the Late Bronze Age. The Late Bronze Age is a period from about, about 1500 to about 1200 BCE. It's a period in which the people in the land, uh, what we call nowadays Israel, Palestine, the Southern Levant, choose your term, um, are for the most part what we would call Canaanites. This is a period in which the Ancient Near East is, a, is, is in a period of flourishing, international connections. The Canaan, Israel-Palestine, is, is, uh, is under the, uh, the rule of the Egyptian empire. And we know of a dense uh, set, a pattern of settlement in the, uh, in the southern Levant. And here we have a suggested recreation of the relationship between the various sites um, in the southern part of Israel during this time. And among others, we know this based on the, the well-known um, collection of letters that were found in Egypt at the site of El Amarna, which tell us of the correspondence between the Egyptian king uh, and various Canaanite uh, kings or princes of the time. And among other things, we, we know of the kingdom of God and of the city of God. And as you can see, actually, a few letters from uh, Shuardata, one of the kings of God, and perhaps another one as well. And it's clear that God plays a, a, in Canaanite scale, a relatively important role in the, uh, during that, this period. And based on our excavations, we can see some of these finds. So we'll start in the, uh, on the eastern side of the, t uh, uh, the site, on an area called Area E. Uh, and there you can see we found a, a large building, which seems to be a building of a, a, a rich person with a lot of very interesting finds. And this is what we call in, uh, in late Bronze Age ar archaeology of the Levant a patrician house. And it probably was someone who was slightly higher up on the social uh, ladder. And in this building, we found all kinds of very interesting finds, um, various Egyptian uh, and Egyptian influence things, cultic deposits, and most importantly also, uh, evidence of the destruction of the site, smash pottery on the floor that perhaps indicates the destruction of the site at the end of the Late Bronze Age, perhaps by the Philistines. At other parts of the site, um, particularly um, in Area F, where um, Jeff and his team um, were excavating, they found a very interesting room with a, a couple of very interesting features, including what might be a matseva, a standing stone, a cultic standing stone, in a room which was virtually devoid of finds, as if it was abandoned and cleaned before it was abandoned. Um, this is uh, apparently evidence of some sort of um, perhaps cultic activity at the site during the Late Bronze Age, and most recently in the There you go. In the, uh, in the excavations in an area called Area P, just this season, 2012, and this is what we saw Area E before. This is Area A. And in this area, we opened up a bunch of squares. And to our very big surprise, we found remains of a, a city wall. Now, um, why, it's a big deal, city wall. Why is that so exciting? Because um, it turns out that there are very few Canaanite sites of the Late Bronze Age which were fortified. And those that were, were most, in most cases, had reused fortifications from the previous period, from the Middle Bronze Age. This is one of the few sites in Canaan that we know of that we have evidence of the, um, a, a fortification built at the site during this period. This would indicate that the, the site of God, the city of God, was an important city. It was a city that not only, we, we can now say this from the, um, from the El Amarna text, but apparently also from the archeological remains. And then this is the city that was taken over and at least partially captured by the Philistines when the Philistines arrive 
um, or slightly after 1200 uh, BC. And by the way, this is a typical um, um, foolish grin that, ar that archaeologists have when they find complete vessels. Uh, uh. Now, um, as I said before, during the, um, during the late Bronze Age, there was a world order. There was trade, there were dip diplomatic relations, we know, everybody knew their place and, and what was going on. And slightly after 1200, this whole wor world order collapses. The Hittite Empire um, is, it basically evaporates. The Egyptian Empire slowly um, gets um, weaker and weaker. The, um, many of the, um, the palace um, states in, in, the, uh, in the Mycenaean culture of uh, modern day Greece are abandoned or destroyed. This is perhaps the time or the, let's say, the historical kernel of the story of the, of the, uh, the Trojan War. And many other things happen. This is when the, um, the Israelites first appear. And among other things, right after the collapse of the late Bronze Age, we have the appearance of groups that are called the Sea Peoples. And these are peoples who, much of them, derive from the area of Greece, Western Turkey, Cyprus, this, these parts of Asia Minor, and even farther afield from south, uh, southeastern Europe and even Sardinia and Sicily, apparently. And these groups come to the eastern Mediterranean and settle along the coast, the eastern coast of what would now be southern Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, um, Israel, and Palestine. And one of these groups settled in the southern coastal plain, the area between modern-day Tel Aviv and modern-day Gaza, and these are the Philistines. And when the Philistines settle, they start a, a very interesting new culture, a culture which we can very clearly see that these are foreigners. These are not local people, but rather a, a culture which was highly influenced from all kinds of new things that have come into the region with the arrival of these new peoples. And this can be seen very, very clearly in the excavation area, which Jeff supervises, Area F. And here you can see uh, very nicely on a, an excavation that's carried out along a slope. Now, since we're dealing with a, a multi-period site, if you excavate along the slope, in theory, you'll catch the various levels as you go down. And this is exactly what happens here. We start at the lower part at the early Bronze Age, then the Middle Bronze Age, the Late Bronze Age, various stages of the Iron Age, and all the way up to the Persian period, to the, the beginning of the Second Temple period in Jewish history. And this is, gives us a very nice cross-section of the, of the development of the site, but in particular, one second, we want, we're interested in um, this area here because this shows us the, uh, the very, very beginning of the uh, of the uh, arrival of the Philistines and their typical material culture. And here's Jeff and his uh, pirates, um, or Captain Shadwick, we should call him. Uh, and, uh, and here's examples of, Kim, that's for you, uh, 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 of, of uh, some of the finds of the very earliest phases of the Iron Age coming out. And this is when um, the Philistines come, and when the Philistines come, we start seeing all kinds of things that are very not typical of what we had in this region beforehand. And so, for example, we find types of pottery which are not local Levantine pottery, but pottery that is very similar to the pottery that we have in Greece at the same time, but locally made. Because when the Philistines came, they didn't only come warriors, they came entire families and and and, and, and communities, including the potters. So the potters came and made the pots that they were familiar with. And they brought with them um, types of technology. For example, we, we found some plaster levels which are made in a technology that is not similar to the technologies that's plaster used in the Levant up to this period, but rather it's a type of plaster that we know of in the Aegean, in the ancient um, Minoan and Mycenaean culture. So it's not only objects, but even knowledge of how, how you make things. And they cook differently. And we know today that one of the most dominant 
ways in which we differentiate ourselves from a cultural community level is what we eat. And uh, we talk about um, uh, Jewish food, Polish food. Um, you know, we always joke that the only food, the only um, uh, food that's uh, national food which is not good is British food, but even that's typical. Um, uh, and the, um, you know a lot about a per who a person is by the type of food uh, they have, particularly in traditional cultures. And we can see that the Philistines, when they arrive and they bring foreign um, traditions with them, they start cooking their food differently. They use different cooking um, devices. They have, instead of using a closed mud oven as typically used in the Levant before and after the Philistines, they cook on open fires, on open um, hearths. And um, this is something clearly indicating that they're cooking their food different. So for example, imagine if the Philistines came from Greece and back in Greece they ate souflaki and tzatziki or you know, whatever they did. When they came to, to the Levant, well, I'm, I'm just joking, they didn't necessarily eat uh, souflaki and tzatziki, you hope you realize, um, they had to cook the food the way they did it back there. And that means they had different cooking installations, different cooking vessels, different serving vessels, and more importantly, and this by the way is trying to study the hearths and how, how they were made, what they cooked in them, what temperatures, what fuels they used, et cetera. And by the way, this is a very important and interesting uh, aspect is that we have a very, very unique um, system uh, in, in our work in the field is that we bring in the archeolog archeological scientists into the field as opposed to finding the finds and then saving them and sending to the labs after the excavation when men, much of the meaning is lost, here we try to have the, the, the work done in the field in close collaboration and this way we can identify things on site and if necessary change our, um, the, uh, the strategy of our excavation um, as we're going along. And, but wh what I'm trying to say is we can see this also in diet, in what they're eating. And we can see both from the animal bones and from the, the botanical remains that the Philistines had aspects, foods in their diet, which were not typical of the diet uh, of other people in the Levant. And the Philistines are well known. They didn't eat such cute pigs and puppies, but um, they did eat um, dog and, 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 and pig meat. And this is very, very different from for example, the Israelites, who at this time, most of them were not eating uh, pig meat. And by the way, this perhaps is the very earliest archeological evidence of the beginning of what later becomes the Jewish dietary laws, the kashrut laws. And the Philistines, many of them did eat pig meat. So this is a very clear differentiation between different cultural groups, which is a, if you want to, something that um, only if you're aware of this issue and you're looking at the bones can you actually uh, find this. Now, uh, another very interesting find that we found in this uh, area called Area A is a apparent evidence of a, a temple. And when excavating below uh, a big destruction layer, which I'll be speaking about in a moment, we found uh, a, a, the remains of a building, more or less rectangular in shape, with two pillar bases, very well made, right in the middle, and uh, right in the middle, and the two pillar bases are positioned exactly two meters and fifteen centimeters from center to center, which means that it was put at exactly uh, four royal Egyptian cubits. Now that means that the uh, person who planned this was very well aware of the need to plan this out very well. Now, this is interesting because we know of at least this temple and another Philistine temple at Tel Kassila, which has a similar plan. These plans are similar to the plans that we know of some temples in the Mycenaean world. And if we uh, reconstruct, there would be two pillars in the middle. And who does that remind us of? Now, I'm not saying that this is the story of Samson knocking down the, the, uh, the pillars. And in fact, if you look at the story, the story occurred in Gaza. Um, and, but the, let's put it this way. This gives us 
a very nice example of how we can use the archaeological evidence to understand the biblical text better. Here we have a very nice example of the biblical cultural background in which the person writing the story of Samson and, 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 and the Philistines, when he wrote about a Philistine temple, he perhaps in his mind had the image of what a Philistine temple actually looks like. And it's not a large Greek temple, and it's not a Canaanite temple, but it's a temple that in its middle, there were two uh, pillars, just at the distance that even, even if you weren't as tall as this guy, but you can still reach him, and in theory at least, if you're very strong, knock them over. So here you have an example of how we can use um, the, the archaeological finds to, if you want to, so put some more flesh on the bones of the, of the biblical story. Now, another very interesting uh, find right next to the temple was a, an area with metallurgical finds. And again, when we look at the biblical text, the biblical text tells us that the, the, the Israelites didn't have metal uh, finds, and they had to go down to the Philistines to make them. Now, up until now, we've had no only evidence of metal making among the Israelites. We never had it at the Philistines, so this is an important addition here of telling us something about the, uh, the metallurgical know-how of the Philistines. A very interesting find that came up, um, uh, I think it was in 2004, is a, a small sherd. The whole thing is about this size. That's, that's five centimeter scale. And on it, it has um, archaic alphabetic letters. This is an, an aleph or an A. A, a lamed or a, an L, a vav or a W, a, a taf or a, tet or a T, a dividing line, and then vav, lamed, taf. And we've suggested that these are two non-Semitic names in a languages similar to various Indo-European languages such as ancient Greek or Lydian or, Hidu, or, or Hittite or, or, or the sort. And this might be very interesting because we might have here evidence of the Philistines in the 10th century, the date of this object, um, using names that are not Semitic, that means names that they brought with them then when they came from wherever they came, but on the other hand, already writing in the alphabetic script, which is typical of the Levant. And this is a very good example of what goes on uh, with the Philistine culture. It's foreigners coming to a er new area and slowly having a a fusion, or if you want in uh, an anthropological term, an entanglement, entanglement with the local cultures in which slowly a new culture is formed and constantly evolves and changes along um, the period. And this is actually uh, a very interesting find because um, uh, when we first found it and we looked at this, na this name Alwat, it reminded us very much of up till, up till then what the etymology of the name Goliath was. Now, nobody's claiming that this is Goliath's cereal bowl, but nevertheless, it's two Semitic names which belong in general to the same family of names that the name Goliath comes from. So this tells us something very interesting about who the Philistines were, what were their ethnic origins, what language they spoke, what names they used, um, etc. cetera. Now, um, and this is, this is a picture taken. Here's... Uh, here's Jeff, here's myself, a couple of other people, and you notice the, the, the look, uh, 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 this is a great picture of, uh, of a look of right after something unusual uh, 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 comes up. Um, now, perhaps the most impressive thing that we excavated throughout the, um, the season that we've been working on the site is evidence of an enormous destruction, and that's all that's marked off in red here, that we date now to the mid 9th century BCE. And wherever we excavated on the tail, we find a, a layer where houses collapsed, many of them burnt down, and hundreds and hundreds of finds um, um, in these houses. Some of them in perfect state of preservation as if they came out of the potter's workshop the day before. And every type of vessel you can imagine, uh, storage vessels, uh, ser uh, um, serving vessels, cultic vessels, you name it, it's here. And this represents a very specific moment in time when the site was destroyed. We'll speak about in a moment who destroyed the site. And if you want to, it's almost like a Pompeian moment. And, and it gives us this frozen moment in time of around 830 BCE when the site was destroyed. And it gives us a, this astounding ability to recreate what life was 
in each house and in the site in general at that specific uh, moment. What type of houses they had, where they kept this, where they kept that, where they cooked, where they stored, uh, and onwards and onwards. And we find evidence of the people who were killed on the site in this destruction. And here we have fragmentary skeletons that were found. We have evidence of cultic corners, including um, some very interesting objects that were found right um, in one of these uh, rooms. And most importantly, we have evidence of a large lower city, which doubles the size of the site from about 170 uh, hectares, excuse me, um, not 170 dunam, 17 hectares, um, to what we now know is more like 500 dunam, 50 hectares, which is about 120 acres. This is, turns it into one of the largest sites in Levant. In fact, perhaps the largest site in the whole Iron Age, southern Levant, um, at this period. And in the lower city, we excavated an area, and right below surface, we find remains of buildings, and in this building, all kinds of interesting finds, including an altar that I will speak about in a moment, some interesting uh, features such as a pit, um, a pa paved floors, concentrations of loom weights. What we may have here is a cultic area. Now, this is a very interesting, uh, I just want to tell a little story here of the chance finds of, uh, of how, you, how excavating. This is how this area looked at the end of our excavation in 2010. As you notice, the balk lines are very nice and straight, and we're ready to close up and go home for the, um, until the next summer comes the summer, the winter of 2010-11, of a lot of rains, and all the balks start collapsing. We come back in the summer of 2011, uh, uh, and we start straightening the balks, and this little thing appears. And then we continue going on, and until the whole thing popped out. And it turned out that if it hadn't rained during that winter, the ball, the, this, the box, the, the, a balk is the sort of like the edges of a square, and we make them in five by five meter squares. And the meeting point of four balks, of four squares, creates a, an area of about a meter on a meter, by a meter. And it turns out that this um, altar, which I'll speak about in a moment, sat exactly in this uh, unexcavated area. So if it wasn't for the rain that season, we would have missed this whole uh, object. And what is this object? This object is, a, is a, uh, a stone altar made out of one piece of uh, stone. And you can see it has a very interesting dimension, which I'll talk about in a moment, 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters by, me by a meter. It has, uh, it's partially um, you know, finished, the front sides and the front part of the upper part. It has two horns. And this turns it into a very unique uh, object. Why? First of all, it's dimensions. As in, if we turn this into um, cubits, it's one by one by two cubits. And this is very similar to the size of one of the altars mentioned in the tabernacle. Now again, this is not an altar from the tabernacle, but it means that both for the Philistines and the Israelites, the, an object of that dimension was of importance, of cultic significance. Um, another in, 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 in very interesting indication is that most altars that we know from the Israelites and other Levantine cultures, and in fact from the Philistines at later stages, have four horns, and this is also the, what we understand from the depiction of the altar in the, in the biblical text as well. And here we have only two horns, and this may be an indication of, again, an example of this fusion of Western and Eastern cultural elements that we see in the, physic, in the Philistine um, uh, culture. Of course, here are the typical altars that we see in uh, the Iron Age in most uh, cultures, but we have altars in the Aegean area and in Cyprus, in which we have two horns, 
So perhaps what we have here is the Philistines using a cultic object, which on the one hand is very similar to the cultic objects used by other cultures in the Levant at the time, but retaining their traditions that they brought with them of altars with only two horns. A very interesting example of this eclectic culture of the Philistines. And here are some very interesting finds that we, um, uh, that we uh, had this, uh, around this altar, a couple of inscriptions. By the way, this inscription is very interesting. It's, it's made on a jar, which uh, when we check this out petrographically, um, that it, it turns out it's a jar made in the Jerusalem area, which is not under Philistine control, and it has a name uh, which is a, seems to be an Israelite and not a Philistine name, and um, it might mean that someone in Judah sent a, a jar as an offering to a, a cultic context in Philistia. So it's an example of that, uh, you know, we always say that, you know, why did the, you know, why did the uh, prophets complain about idolatry and, and multiple gods? Because that's what the Israelites did. And this is a very nice example of perhaps a, uh, not only the, cu the cultural connections between the Israelites and the Philistines, but perhaps also cultic interactions. Uh, not the, the cultural, but also cultic. Um, and... Here, this is an example of a, uh, a chalice, a decorated chalice, which was used for incense, burning of incense, which was found right near the, um, right near the uh, altar as it's being uh, excavated. And of course, this is views of um, the happy campers as they found the altar. Um, now, who caused this destruction? And for various reasons, and even though we don't have a um, you know, a text again, I destroyed the site. In the biblical text, it tells us that Hazael, the king of Aram Damascus, in 2 Kings 12, 17 or 18, depending on what version you use, uh, then Hazael, king of Syria, went up, fought against Gat, and took it. And then the story goes on that he went to Jerusalem, got the, the Joash gave the, the treasure, temple treasures to him, etc., and, and it goes on. And, and in a half of a passage, um, this event is apparently uh, described, and this event is perhaps one of the most important geopolitical events that occurred in the Southern Levant in the Iron Age too. The destruction of what up till then was the largest site in, in Canaan. And in fact, it could very well be that the destruction of Gat around 830 had a very important effect on the entire region and might have enabled the kingdom of Jerusalem to start expanding. Because up until then, to the west of the kingdom of Jerusalem, of Judah, there was this enormous city-state, Gat. And once it was destroyed, we have um, the possibility of expanding um, that kingdom as well. And a very interesting feature that we can associate with this is the siege system, which I mentioned before. And around the site, I'll go back here, we have evidence of this feature you can see in the aerial photograph. And when we started surveying and excavating it, it turned out it's comprised of a deep trench excavated out in the stone. The material from it is always poured out on the side away from the site. And what we have here is this, I'll go on, this enormous siege system which surrounds the site. What would be in Roman times would be called a circumvallation, like the Roman siege of Masada or Alasia. Uh, and here you can see the the siege, this is from the eastern side, and the various components of the siege with the, with the trench and the berm, the, the materials poured over. We found a few of these towers, and they probably had a makeshift uh, wall around it. And in the background, you have the city itself. And what this did is it meant it enclosed the people in. They couldn't escape. They couldn't receive um, supplies and reinforcements, and it made it difficult for them to attack the, besiege, the, the besieging army. And this is a very, very unusual type of siege in the ancient Near East, but here we have evidence of it, and it's perhaps also, most importantly, the earliest evidence of a siege on the ground that we have anywhere in the world. And, you know, we always want to have the earliest, the biggest, the best, you know, so, so we have the earliest here. Um, uh, now, when do I date this? And I won't go into it. There have been various suggestions for when this campaign occurred. And I, I prefer uh, putting it somewhere around 830, 835, 
but that's a different uh, lecture. Okay, now, Hazael destroys Gat, and it stops being an important city, but the story doesn't end here. And going back to, um, uh, to area F, um, Jeff's area, um, we have evidence of the destruction of the city, and then a phase in which the city is abandoned, and apparently we have evidence of an earthquake, we'll speak about it later, and then two phases in which we see evidence that the site is settled by the Judahites. It's not a Philistine site anymore, but a Judahite site. How do we know this? Because the material culture, you'll see this in a moment, is different. It's, it's similar to the type of finds we would find in Judah, in, in Judah at sites such as Jerusalem or Lachish at the time. But let's move on. Now, so after its destruction, the site is abandoned. And then there's evidence of an earthquake, perhaps the Amos earthquake. We'll see this in a moment. And then it's resettled again. Um, uh, perhaps by uh, the Judites, and then apparently destroyed even twice by the, uh, um, by the Assyrians. Now, um, this, this is a very interesting piece of evidence. Notice here, that's the top of the destruction level. If we would excavate down there, and since then we have, um, we'd find the remains of the, all those beautiful vessels that we spoke ab about. And then, here we have this mush, which is basically a bricks collapse, and and to Jeff's credit, he is the first person who noticed this, that what we have here is again and again and again evidence of a big mass of bricks that collapse. And underneath it, there's a level of very thin sediment, which the geomorphologists have analyzed and say it's a windblown sediment. That means that after the destruction of the ninth century, there was a period of abandonment, and only then this brick collapse occurred. Now, what happened here? and then we have above it the eighth century. Imagine that on this wall is a long wall that above it, this is the foundation, a stone foundation. Above it, there was a big a brick superstructure. And then an earthquake came, and first, the first wave, the uh, horizontal wave, which hits first of energy, comes and knocks the, um, the, the wall off the foundation. And then the second wave, the so-called S wave, which is a wavy wave, hits slightly later and knocks the bricks over. And then we can see here how they're collapsed to the side. And since we have 9th century date here and 8th century dates right above, it's clear that this event which we've brought in seismologists, engineers, et cetera, and the only explanation that they could offer why these bricks would have collapsed in this manner was that it's related to seismic activity, means that we probably, here we have various places where we see this thing, means that most probably we have evidence of a mid-8th century earthquake, which fits in very well with the biblical evidence, most famous in the beginning of Amos, that he, uh, he, he started his prophecy two years before the earthquake, Shnataim Lifnei Harash, the Rash in, in he, Biblical Hebrew, uh, we would say in modern Hebrew, Rash means noise, but it's an earthquake. Uh, and it's mentioned in uh, Zachariah as well, and, and a couple of times it's hinted to in, 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 uh, in other books, such as in Isaiah. And this apparently was a major, major event which destroyed sites at the time, and this is very important, by the way, because over the years there have been various biblical and archaeological uh, arche archaeologists who have suggested that this was a, a, a very minor event. And here we have very nice evidence that it was of a very significant event. Now, the site is destroyed by the earthquake. A couple of years later, Hezekiah, king of Judah, starts expanding the kingdom. He's a troublemaker. He... he uh, he makes, uh, gets all the people in southern and the southern Levant up against the Assyrians, organizes a revolt, and uh, uh, actually even before that, uh, the first, the, uh, the Sargon II, the, the Assyrian comes, king comes, but then when As Hezekiah actually organizes a real revolt, Sennacherib, his son, comes, and as soon as Sennacherib comes, all the people who join in with Hezekiah, um, you know, uh, immediately leave the scene. And poor Hezekiah is left to fight Sennacherib on his own, not very successfully. He escapes to Jerusalem, and for some miraculous reason, described by the Bible, by Herodotus and others, uh, and for different reasons, the Assyrians besiege Jerusalem, but don't capture it. And because they didn't capture it, 
Jerusalem survived for another 120 years or so. And, um, but what happened, and we know this from the biblical sources, from the Assyrian sources, and from the archaeological evidence, that the Judites, the Judite kingdom, attempted to expand to the west, into Philistia, into sites such as Gat, and here we have the archaeological evidence of Judite-style houses and Judite-style material, culture, um, pottery, figurines, um, uh, inscribed handles, and other things, and they were kicked out, and these, the site was destroyed. And so this is the end of the Iron Age history of of Gat, but if it started as a Philistine site, it ends it as, a, as an Israelite or Judite site. And then uh, we'll bump, uh, jump forward a few centuries, and in 1099, the first crusade, the crusaders capture the entire land of, uh, of Palestine, save for the city of Ashkelon, where the Fatimid Muslims still hold out, and the the crusaders build a string of forts around Ashkelon to surround the city. One of them was at the site of Tel Asafi, and they called the, the fortress that they built Blanche Guard, the White Fortress. Why? Because of the white cliffs that we mentioned before. And um, it was built right on the summit of the Tel. Now, when we started the project, we very much wanted to excavate this uh, fortress, but unfortunately, uh, for us that is, um, it was covered by a modern graveyard, and the local Palestinians didn't want us to excavate it, and it was understandable because their, their grandparents were excavated, at, uh, were not excavated, they were, were buried there, and we wanted to uh, not to, uh, I wouldn't want someone excavating the cemetery where my grandfather was buried, so we respected their wish, but very fortunately, in the area where Jeff is excavating, here you can see area F down here and the summit over here, and this is a, sort of like a recreation of the inner and fortification of the, of the, of the castle. That's the, the Crusader castle at Beirut, but I, as an example. And the outer fortification, and very fortunately for us, the very tip of the outer fortification comes out in area F and Jeff's area. And so over the years, we've expanded. By the way, we, we, don't, only have, we don't only have Goliath. We have Richard the Lionhearted. Um, he also came through the site. Uh, um, so um, here we can see the various um, stages of, the, of parts of this, of this fortification. And just this summer, we managed to excavate a beautifully preserved section of the Crusader Wall and a very nice fortress. And here you can see Jeff standing in front of this beautiful for, um, uh, tower before it was excavated out this way. And now you can see the tower and a very large section of the wall. So even though, unfortunately, we won't be able to excavate the entire fortress, we have a nice section of this beautiful masonry built in, uh, in typical Crusader uh, style um, by the Crusaders when they were defending uh, the site. Now, this site is very soon, in the mid-12th uh, uh, century, it is captured by Salah Saladin, Salahadin, the Ayyubid, the, the guy who uh, who fought with Richard the Lionhearted and got the best of it. And, but the site continued to be an important site, and a village existed there throughout the, the centuries after that, until the village that we already saw beforehand of Tel Asafi, the, uh, which existed until 1948. And we have various evidence of the cemeteries, of the mosque, of the destroyed houses, etc. And so here we close the the circle from the early periods until the later periods, and this is what we've been excavating and the cultures that we've been finding at Tel Asafi. And I can just uh, finish by, uh, we can invite you to come and uh, join us at, on the team. And, and I don't have to do too much explaining. I have a representative here who, any question you want, you can ask him. But uh, I, I, one of the reasons to come is sometimes I make pizza, so. Uh, uh, and. Thank you very much.